Shane. We enter into what you want to reveal, what you want to show to us. Open our our hearts, open our, our ability to hear you. Le como no naya romo no shana naya le tene. Ite toro como no shoto toro mo no shana ne. Le toto como no shana naya le to toro mo no shana naya le to como no shata taya le to toro mo no shana naya le ne nere me ne shana. And anything that is not of your spirit, we bind it, we refuse it, we want nothing to do with it. Be gone, have no influence on us, this place, or anyone here today, in Jesus' name. And we welcome you, we welcome you to, to govern, to rule, to guide, to do what you want here this morning, in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Let's be in agreement on it, amen. <clears throat> I updated the handout I'm not sure I even sent the updated one to you, Kevin. Did I? Okay. All right. So it is online. For those of you who are watching online, welcome. Good morning. And uh, there is, it looks the same at the beginning, but I added some pages at the end. Um, <clears throat> so we looked at the first page, and we talked about what offense is, what it looks like. It's hanging on to something, the, the, the trap stick. There, the, the definition of the word offense on page one, letter B, um, and how that works. We explain that. Don't want to go over it. O Webster offense, something that, has caused, that causes a person to be hurt, angry, or upset. Something that's wrong or improper. Of course, that's according to our perspective. And that really showed up because we asked the question, and I listed these out. They're on page seven. How do we know if we're offended? I thought this should really be added to the handout because I found it really interesting uh, how, we, how we look at ourselves and how we find if we're offended or not. So I, there was 12 different answers, so I listed them all out there. In summary, offense comes from getting hurt or getting wounded by something and then not letting it go. And when we don't let it go, it just stays on our mind, it keeps bothering us, etc. that begins developing an attitude. And the attitude, first of all, seems to separate the relationship, whatever relationship there was there, it separates relationships, breaks relationships. But then it turns judgmental, critical. Um, we, start, we start getting upset with the other person. Those were the three if you want to summarize page seven, those are the three things that really showed up from your answers last Sunday, and I thought it was really good. That's why I included it. Um, go to page 10 with me. We're going to start at the back. So page seven, the question last Sunday was, how do we know if we're offended? Okay? The question... This morning, which ties into Romans 9 there, that's why we went there, is why do we get offended? Two different questions. One is how do we know when we are? Well, why did we get offended to begin with? Letter F there, this is a huge principle found in these scriptures that gives us some answers to this. Um, I said, can you find it? Well, I'll help you see it this morning. So read through that with me. Romans 9. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not follow the right after righteousness, who did not seek salvation by right relationship with God, have attained it by faith, a righteousness imputed by God based on and produced by faith, which was a total insult to the Israeli thinking of that time. To traditional Israelis, it's still a total insult to them because they worked so hard to try to do everything right. The law, measuring up. And the Gentiles come along and just get it by faith. And it's like, what? Verse 31, whereas Israel, though ever in pursuit of a law for the securing of righteousness. They were always trying to make sure they got the law right, make sure they're doing everything right so they'd be righteous, be in right standing with God, actually did not succeed in fulfilling the law. Huh. 
So the ones who were trying the hardest never made it. And the ones who weren't really trying very long at all, the Gentiles, by faith they got in. For what reason? Now catch this, this is the first answer. Because they pursued it not through faith, relying instead on the merit of their works. I can do this good enough to be righteous. What is that? Pride. Pride. Why do we get offended? One reason is pride. And that, that goes a whole bunch of directions. I mean, they actually said that to me. Who do they think they are? Well, who do you think you are? See, offense reveals us, not them. They usually get the blame, but it's actually showing what's in our heart. They didn't pursue it through faith like the Gentiles did. In fact, they got upset with that whole thing because we've been working at this how long? And we're still not good enough. They were insulted. They were offended. And he's going to say that here in a bit. End of verse 32. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, which we'll read that in some other places. That's Jesus. The stumbling stone is Jesus. They stumbled over it because they were bound determined. They were good enough in what they were doing. That's why the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they came off with such pride such arrogance, and Jesus would call them on it because I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. Ooh. You know, Paul said that. So there was a pride issue, and when you came against something they were really proud about, they got offended. Okay? That same thing can happen to us. You drive up with your new car, new pickup, new whatever, and someone says something derogatory towards it, and all of a sudden you're offended. Why? Because you were feeling so good about it. Now your feelings are hurt. I really like the color. They think it's ugly. Now your feelings are hurt, and now you're offended. And it rooted into pride. Follow on. Verse 33. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone that will make men stumble. God's doing this on purpose. <laughs> a rock that will make them fall. Now, there's two things applied to Jesus, and it, whenever that's talked about, it's an Old Testament prophecy, Isaiah 28, 16. But whenever it's talked about, two things show up in the New Testament. Stone, Jesus is a stone that makes men stumble, and he's a rock of offense. I'm reading the Amplified there, a rock that will make them fall. But if you read the other translations, King James, New King James, etc., it says rock of offense. But he who believes in him, who adheres in who had to hear to, trust in, and relies on him, shall not be put to shame, nor disappointed in his expectations. So God intentionally set this up so it's easy for us to fall, to stumble, to trip over this truth, or to actually get offended by this truth of Jesus. But if we use faith, which that's what he's talking about here, if we believe in him, two things won't happen. Well, these two things are revealing why we get offended. We won't be put to shame. Shame is when you feel really bad about yourself and what you've done in your existence and who you are, and it can go in numerous different directions. It was the, one of the first things that showed up after the fall in the garden was shame. Okay, so it's really deep-rooted in the human race. What is shame based on? It's a dual thing. Pride is mixed in with it, and what else? Somebody said it. Fear. We are afraid 
to look bad. We're afraid to be made fun of. We're afraid to be pointed out as inadequate or we don't measure up. See, that's that all that shame realm. We're afraid that someone is going to say we're not good enough. We don't measure up. Shame is rooted in fear because I don't want that to happen. I, 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 people who are afraid of public speaking, it's rooted in fear because of, well, I don't want to look bad. Shame. I don't want to get in front and say all kinds of dumb things. Shame. Because, see, then you don't measure up. So just play a scenario. So you get up and you testify or you say something or I ask you to come up and speak for five minutes and you just butcher it. It's just you fall all over yourself. If someone comes up to you and says, it didn't go too well, did it? You're going to be offended. Right? If that, That's going to be a hurt. I mean, you actually said that to me. I know it was really bad. And then you went and bring it up. Why are you so not loving as a Christian? If you hold on to that feeling towards them, you're going to be offended. Shame. So shame and offense go together. When someone does something, says something, somehow it's like we're not as good as everybody else. Guard that. Because if you don't, offense is going to follow. And nor be disappointed in his expectations. expectations. We're expecting it to go a certain way, and when it doesn't, we're offended. Or it's open door for offense. I'll try to give you some examples. When you buy someone a gift for Christmas, are you expecting one back? Now, we shouldn't be, or it's not a gift. I'm a little loud here, I think, Vanessa. I'm ringing a bit, and or echoing a bit. Um, but I know people who have picked up huge offense because I bought them something for three years in a row and they have never bought me anything. That hurts. Why? Are you giving to get? That, that to me, from my perspective, it's like, well, your motives are off. But they have expectations. And if the expectations are not met, their feelings get hurt and they can get offended. <clears throat> Happens all the time between husbands and wives. Well, I thought you were going to do this. And then you went and did that. And then if it happens over and over, then pretty soon we hear things like, well, you know what he's like. You're offended. That's where that statement would come out of. Because you had expectations of what would happen in the relationship and for five times it didn't happen that way, and you're holding on to it, and it's coming out of your mouth. Well, you know what? This one, you know what men are like. That's a statement of offense. You're hanging on to hurts that you've never let go of, and as a result, it, or it came from not having certain expectations met, but now you're holding on like a monkey to those hurts and you're being critical, judgmental towards men. Well, you know what men are like. Well, maybe we are like that. That's not the point. The point is, you're offended. That's where racism comes out of. Well, you know what, fill in whoever, whatever color, whatever term you want to put there. You know what those people are like. That's a racist statement. And chances are really good that statement's coming out of your own offense. Because someplace you have a story you could relate that gives you the attitude of why you feel that way towards those people. That story is unforgiveness. You've never let it go. It is, it is coloring your thinking today. It's offense. So... <clears throat> 
I was going to ask earlier, can I bring up one example that we shared? Cindy was so awesome last Sunday. She, she stepped right out on the water and walked and brought something up that I thought was just perfect example. She said that uh, there's been times there's things I have said in speaking that have offended her. See, now my hat's off to her to even you know, say it, admit it. It's like, that's awesome, but now we can learn from this. Okay, so during the week, we texted back and forth someone. I said, give me an example. What did I say that offended you? So she gave me an example, and this was one that is, I don't know, this goes back 2014, 2015, something like that. I made this statement. I said, under grace, under salvation, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, okay? Under the grace system, we work as a gift to each other. What I do for you is a gift. What you do for me is a gift. What God does for me is a gift. Everything turns from law, which is you are required, you are commanded, you, you must, to I love you, and I want to do this for you because I love you. It becomes a gift. Follow the thinking? Okay, that's what we were talking about. Then I made this statement. I said, as your pastor, I don't owe you a thing. And as congregational members, you don't owe me anything. And see that she admitted that bothered her. And I thought, well, that's good. We should talk about that. Just because I don't owe you doesn't mean I don't want to help you or work with you. And just because you don't owe me doesn't mean you don't want to be part of what we're doing. It's a motivation check. Let me say it this way. Does God owe us anything? You're sure. He doesn't owe us anything. Okay? Okay. So then why would I owe you something if he doesn't? I'm supposed to be an imitator of him. If he owes nothing, we owe nothing. This is deep. You're going to have to put your thinking cap on. Okay? So she, uh, she, as we were talking, she said, well, initially it hurt my feelings. Why would that happen? When I say, Ken, I don't owe you anything. Why would that hurt Ken's feelings? Because he thinks I do. It's an expectation. Well, you're my pastor. You owe me something. No, I really don't. I want to minister to you. I want to counsel you. I want to help you. I want to guide you. I... I want to bury you because that means I'm living longer than you. <laughs> Some of you younger ones I can't say that about. But anyway, I want to, but I don't owe it to you. The same way you want to help and you want to be involved and you want to be a part. But all I'd have to do is say, you're part of this church. You owe it. Get yourself in gear. That would not be good for the long term. That would not be good for relationship. It would not be good for you wanting to do much of anything. You'd probably go home, and at lunch table, I'd be the topic, and it'd be like, what makes him think I owe it to him? But see, if we have been taught certain expectations then when something comes out that doesn't meet the expectation, we can get hurt. And if we hang on to that, we can get offended. Now, by the way, if you go back to page number five, the bottom of the page, and I got a piece of a video I want to show you before we're done. 
This doesn't take the whole thing, and this is just the heart of it. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet's not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of unbelief. And I use King James mostly through this, not because I like reading King James, but because it uses the word offense or offended most often, most clearly. Okay? So now if you back up about oh, 10, 15 verses, in this chapter, Jesus is doing some heavy teaching. And this was the result. Who does he think he is to say these things? We know him. We know his family. We know his brothers and sisters. Who does he think he is? They didn't expect him to say what he was saying. And they got offended. He probably stepped on some toes. Jesus did that from time to time. And they got offended. Because in their mind, this is who he is, this is how he should be behaving. And now he's stepping out like he's some kind of great teacher, he's some kind of religious person, and they got offended with him. So if you get offended with my teaching, I'm in good company. They got offended with Jesus' teaching too. And usually offense in something that's said like that is tied to one of those three. Fear, fear of getting hurt, fear of being shamed, pride, or an expectation. We were not expecting church to go an hour past noon. And people get offended over stuff like that. Rather than entering into what the Spirit is trying to accomplish and just go with it, no, we're going to go with our expectations. And now we're upset. And if this is going to, now fear is going to talk. And if this is how this church is going to be every Sunday, we're not, we're going to find one that's done at noon. So you're afraid we're going to go too long and interrupt your schedule. Oh, this is good, isn't it? <laughs> so I've got there's only one guy who I, I follow occasionally who's a prophet um, I've kind of shoved the rest under the bus because they just missed it so bad now a couple of them apologized and owned they missed it during the COVID last election that whole thing um, and that's okay I just don't feel drawn to follow them but there's one guy who has been consistent, and he's been pretty good in hitting it, so every so often I peek in on him. Now, he had a prophecy for 2024 that I never listened to, but I was going along, and he popped up, and I just felt my spirit go, listen to this. It was about April of 2024, the month we're in. So I listened to it, and I thought, whoa, that's really good. So I pulled a couple of excerpts out of it that I want you to hear uh, concerning offense. So listen to this, if you would, please. Go ahead and play that. Lord, say to me, I want you to go back to your prophecy for the, for the year 2024, because sometimes we don't realize as prophets, we're actually prophesying our own season as well. We think that we're prophesying everybody else's famine and not our own famine. We think we're prophesying everybody else's storm and not the storm we're going to go through ourselves. And so... As I went back to watch over that word, I want to give you this uh, uh, bootleg version. Look at this. That would challenge the status quo. And the Spirit of God says this battle will spill into the church. For many will fight leadership in this next few seasons, saying and thinking they're doing it in the name of the Lord, but the Spirit of God says 
This will be a year where we see brother with great brother and Christian rise up against their leaders, roaring blood, saying these men can bleed. It's a spirit of... I believe that we're in that season right now, that this is that moment. And we're going to see shakings in churches. I know our church has been through a little bit of a turbulent season. We're going to see ministry shake. We're going to see churches shake. Why? Because the enemy is angry. And so he's affecting the communication lines. But in the midst of it, I want you to know the Lord says, I am using this as a moment to sift out like a sieve that which is not meant to be a part of your next season. And let me tell you the painful part of that just so you can be prepared. The Lord said to me that I want you to tell them that God is going to sift you from bad people and good people. God is going to sift you. And you, you, you're going to be like, God, what do you mean, prophet? Tell me. God is going to shake not just uh, not just the, the bad people out of your life. I want to prepare you that God is going to shake some of the, the best people out of your life as well. And you're going to look and you're going to go, God, I don't understand. Why are you shaking? Why are you shaking good people? What are you doing right now to these great people? And the Lord says, I am intent that my vision and my word stands in the earth more than I am intent on you keeping your special relationships. And so what I'm doing right... Okay, catch that part. Once good people stop us from doing what God needs us to do, he will shake them out of our life so his vision gets accomplished and we're not spending all our time with these good people. Okay, go on. Now, it's the Lord says, I am shaking the house because I did not declare that I will build your church. I declared that I will build my church. And the Lord says that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And so the Spirit of God says, sons and daughters, I did not say that hell would not try. I simply said that in their pursuit, they would not prevail. But know this as the Lord, that the Lord says, even as I begin to go through the churches across the world, the Lord says, you will know the churches that are mine, not by their uh, shaking, but the Lord says, by their abiding. For the Lord says, the fruit that abides after the shaking, the Lord says, is the fruit that I am requiring to be strengthened right now in this act. Okay, so now he's going to label some of that fruit. So there is an intentional shaking going on this year, specifically in April. He's going to talk about it yet. And he's looking for who's going to handle the shaking correctly. Okay, go on. Alan. And so the Lord says over you, I am delivering you. I'm delivering you from every man-made relationship. I'm delivering you from every man-made covenant. I'm delivering you from every man-made business deal. I'm delivering you from every man-made negotiation. I'm delivering you from people you thought were your soulmates, but they were your inmates. And the Spirit of God says, allow me to shake so that the Lord says, you'll grieve for a moment, but the Lord says, you'll see on the other side what I have been doing all along was I was preparing the ground, not just for Joseph, but I was preparing the ground for Judah. I was preparing the gr ground for Simeon. I was preparing the ground for Gad. And the Lord says, if you're not careful, you will become April's fool. And the Lord says, you will become offended at the people who I'm not offended with. And the Lord says, you will become enemies in your short-sightedness with the people, says the Lord, that I am not enemies with. And the Lord says, if you are not careful, you will become April's fool, not realizing that 
I am not taking sides in this hour. I am giving everyone their inheritance. And the Lord says, I am dividing the land for inheritance because the Lord says, now the hour has come. But the Spirit of God says this, I can only give inheritance to mature sons for an heir as long as he remains a child is subject to rulers even though he's heir of everything. And so the Spirit of God says, can I lift you to a place where you bless those who curse you, where you pray for those who mistreat you? Because the Lord says, by doing so, how else can I prove who are my children from those that are not? Stop it right there. Are we at the end yet? We're close. Okay. Catch that. The shaking is to determine who is going to be able to handle what's coming. If we're going to get offended, and I'll have you back it up maybe 20 seconds if you can, and replay that little part. If we're going to get offended and handle people the wrong way, God is watching, and he's saying that will disclude you from what's coming, which in the big picture is tremendous outpouring of his spirit. Because we're being tested now to see if we're capable of handling offense, which tells me this. When the spirit really starts moving, there's going to be a lot of offense available. And we just can't pick it up. So he's testing right now to see what churches, what people can handle offense and not pick it up because they're and he's doing it through that shaking and he's doing it for what's coming so we're qualified we're ready now, i will say this there have been ample opportunities to get offended this year especially april it's like they come every other day it's like well there you go i can get offended over that i can get my feelings hurt over that i could get this that and the other if we don't mature enough to get beyond that it will stop us personally or us as a church from being in the next move of the spirit he won't trust us with it because we couldn't handle offense correctly replay that he lists the if if were you able to back up a little bit okay he lists what he's looking for catch this I can only give inheritance to mature sons for an heir as long as he remains a child is subject to rulers even though he's heir of everything. And so the Spirit of God says, can I lift you to a place where you bless those who curse you, where you pray for those who mistreat you? Because the Lord says, by doing so, how else can I prove who are my children from those that are not? So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I release this upon your people, a maturity to forgive, a maturity to let go, a maturity to fret not, and to not need to defend ourselves, but to stand in a place of mercy and intercession in Jesus' name. And everybody can say, Amen. Amen. My so. That's amazing. That's exactly what we're talking about. That's what we're dealing with. Now, he's talking about where things are going to go, and God is qualifying us through giving us opportunities to get our feelings hurt, be offended, and not let it go. If we do that, we're going to disqualify ourselves. We need to be mature enough. We can walk past that stuff and go, I bless them. I pray for them. God, do your best in them. I am not going to badmouth them. I'm not going to talk them down. I'm not going to make fun of them. I am going to learn to handle offense in a godly manner. So we're ready for what's coming. Okay, so now this applies, and I think I'll get into this at the end of the message this morning. This applies specifically to us here because we have not only the move of the Spirit that is promised that that last days in gathering coming, we have some wonderful opportunities that we need to, how would you say, get ready for and make some big decisions on. And in order for God to help us, we can't be offended people. And I'll give you a couple of them. In the next 
few months, we've got to hear the Spirit on where are we going with physical facilities. Now keep this in faith. This Friday we're supposed to close on that land. That's, that's where it's at. It's set. This Friday we're supposed to close on it. The only thing we've heard to this point is the Father hath need of that land. And Brian, who when he was at TBO, said, and he didn't even know we were buying land. He, said, he prophesied and said, the devil is trying to keep that land away from you. He wants it as his. And it's like, what, what does he need a few acres for? To stop us. So that, that is a big thing. He needs that land. Well, he needs it for more than a parking lot. Because I tell you what, when the Spirit begins to move in the in-gathering, this isn't big enough. This isn't big. We, we're not going to be able to house them in here. This isn't big enough. So I'm going to just leave it there until we get into the message, and if it works right, then I'll address it toward the end of the message, or it'll be next Sunday. I'm going to make some applications here. But I find it extremely interesting that we're in a season where God is saying, I'm doing the shaking because I need to see who's mature enough not to get offended because those are the ones I'm going to bless and use. Isn't that wild? So it's direct application to us. So band, if you want to come, we're going to go ahead and pray. Lord, as we follow you, as we seek to hear your spirit, as we listen, we are asking the thing that you're pointing out here, you've been doing it for a few months and and now through Tommy it, it was just kind of reaffirmed The thing you're looking for is for us to grow and be mature enough that offense doesn't become a snare or a trap to us that we get wrapped around and we stop all forward movement. You're going to separate people in the body of Christ. Help us to recognize this, to refuse to let our fear, our hurt feelings, our pride, our expectations to cause us to be offended. Because now, according to the tests that you currently have running, we will just have flunked. We will just have discluded ourselves. And in the name of Jesus, we're not going to do that. I pray for every family, I pray for every father, I pray for every mother, I pray for every young person, I pray for every individual. As things happen in our lives that would give us the opportunity to be offended, because either our pride got hurt or we're fearful of something bad happening, didn't meet our expectations, something here just ground us the wrong way, and we have the opportunity to be offended. Holy Spirit, I am asking you to immediately, with force, get in our face and make sure we don't grab on to that opportunity. We have to grow past the childish way of thinking, like Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, and become adult-like in our thinking. And part of adult-like thinking is we aren't offendable. We can't get offended. That's the goal we're after. So, Lord, as as you're preparing to move us as a body, as you're preparing to move this nation, as you're doing this worldwide, you're preparing to move us forward. I pray for the strengthening of the people and the surrender and submitting of the people to your spirit to go where you want us to go and to get past Specifically, the test right now is offense. To to pass this test, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.